Hey everyone, and I can finally publish something this week if you want to know why I didn't uh, look at my left eye. Massive debilitating allergies. So this week we have local graphical dev package installation being broken in Ubuntu 23.10. And it might look like a small thing, but it's actually a huge problem for beginners. We also have the new GNOME Foundation executive director raising some eyebrows, although I personally cannot understand why. And we have yet another installer tool, uh, something that OpenSUSE is working on to replace the venerable Yast. And speaking of venerable, if you use an old end of life distro, you might want to listen to this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, your all-in-one solution to ensure your Linux server and workstation fleet is secure and up-to-date thanks to kernel live patching and extended lifecycle support for a variety of Linux distributions. This week, they're providing you with a free data sheet to tell you a bit more about the dangers of running an end-of-life Linux distribution. We all know that it can be daunting and time-consuming to plan a migration, to a newer version of a Linux distro, let alone to another distro entirely, while limiting downtime and compatibility issues. But sticking to an end-of-life distro isn't the solution either. Your support costs will rise with the number of compatibility, reliability, and security problems you will face. And you might even incur legal risks by not taking action to ensure an adequate level of security. So, to learn more about the risks of running an end-of-life Linux distribution and about the steps you can take to limit these risks and stay up-to-date while you plan your migration, click the link in the description below and download the free datasheet. So, Ubuntu 23.10 might be a pretty nice release for Ubuntu users, but it did come with one significant regression that I failed to catch in my review. With its brand new App Center, it simply cannot, out of the box, install deb packages you downloaded from the internet, at least not graphically. This might seem like a non-issue until you realize that Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Discord or Steam all provide deb packages that you're supposed to download locally and install with a double click, a behavior that has been possible since virtually the first release of Ubuntu. Of course, you can still use the command line, but the new App Center doesn't support installing their packages from anywhere other than the Ubuntu repos, which is, in my opinion, a huge problem. All software that has an Ubuntu compatible download from their website will simply not be able to be installed graphically out of the box on 23.10, which is going to be a very bad experience for beginners. The solution is obviously to install a tool that can do that, either something like GNOME Software or GDEBI, the latter one being just a graphical deb package installer. This is definitely not a good look for Ubuntu, but also for the general Linux desktop. Most newcomers come from Windows, and there's a big fat chance that they're gonna start with Ubuntu. On Windows, they're used to downloading an installer online, double-clicking it to run it and install their app. If they try this same behavior on Ubuntu, which is normally possible, they're gonna hit a brick wall and they're gonna have to Google or look online for how to install a program, which is something that you should not have to look up. So yeah, not a great look. I hope Ubuntu can fix that in the App Center or every single software distributor will have to include some command line tutorials to install their app, which kind of sucks. The GNOME Foundation has their new executive director, and the choice has been making a few waves in the community. They picked Holly Million, someone who has a solid background in leading various non-profits, but also in filmmaking, writing, and teaching. She notably created the non-profit Artists United, and worked for the BioBricks Foundation, a non-profit in the biotechnology sector. What is sort of striking is that she apparently doesn't have any experience in software projects or in IT. This seems to be raising questions in the community about the selection process, but I personally don't think this is such an issue. The executive director of the GNOME Foundation isn't expected to review code or to collaborate on software. They're expected to be the face of the foundation, to improve communication, to work on fundraising and partnerships. And as such, an experience in management and leading nonprofits 
is way more valuable than the ability to write code. Would it be nice if the person selected had worked on software projects? Sure, but also someone who doesn't have a background in that specific space might have more diverse ideas. And another approach to creating these partnerships and raising funds, they might look at avenues that someone working in IT might not think about. So I personally don't think this is a big deal at all, nor is Holly's background in shamanism, because yes, apparently that's something she has dabbled in. I don't think a personal passion or belief should preclude you from working in different sectors, or maybe me being a YouTuber right now would make me unsuitable to work in any other industry later down the road. I really cannot understand the negative reactions that I've seen around the community about this nomination. If you think that an executive level position requires experience in the exact specific industry that you're working on, you probably never filled an executive position or maybe never even talked to an executive before. When I worked in real estate, most of our executives came from the telecommunication sector and they did an excellent job nonetheless. So yeah, welcome Holly and I hope you can do a good job. Looks like every distro needs to have their own installer these days, as Ubuntu released their own six months ago, and Fedora is working on a complete UI revamp of Anaconda. Well, OpenSUSE also wants another one to replace Yast, which, while it is very complete and powerful, also looks straight out of the Windows 98 era. The new Agama installer would accompany the new ALP OpenSUSE releases, and it focuses on being reusable, presumably to let other distros use it, on integration with third-party applications, and on letting developers create the interface they want to showcase the install options they need. Apparently, Yast has a lot of technical debt, and it isn't easy to contribute to since it uses its own UI library that people have to learn, so a new installer makes sense if they want to evolve things a bit. A few mockups have been shared which look pretty neat, but I'm not sure I like the long scrollable page design they showed here. It also doesn't look anything like any Linux desktop, but I guess that's not an issue for an installer, especially one that lets you pick a desktop environment. They want the install workflow to be simpler than Yast, which will definitely be a better experience for newcomers, and they are looking for feedback from the OpenSUSE community to create something that everyone will like. Installers are the first point of contact a newcomer will have with your distro, so the more legible, the easier to understand they are, the better. And also, installing a system on your own device can be super scary if you've never done it before, so if it looks friendly, if it's reassuring, it's all the better. So old interfaces from the 90s, they're super powerful, but they're also not what we need for newcomers. Now for our round of updates to various Linux desktops, and let's start with Cosmic. First, they unveiled their lock screen, which puts every important item in a sort of card floating above your wallpaper. It looks pretty nice. It has all the features you might want, including a session switcher to use other desktops than Cosmic, and it will support color schemes to customize it. The tiling applet has also been developed, contributed by the community apparently, and letting you get all the features you know from the auto-tiling extension of the current iteration of Pop! OS. Cosmic now supports using a single key as a shortcut, like for example Super to open the launcher, plus they implemented pointer constraints to lock the mouse pointer inside certain windows, like for games, and they also added DMA buff support to let tools like OBS work better on multiple GPU devices like hybrid graphics. Their UI libraries also now support grid layouts to make building apps easier. Very good progress here, and judging from the components that they're now working on and sharing, I would say they couldn't be far off from an alpha release of Cosmic. And on the GNOME side, they improved the performance of VTE, which is the library used to build terminal emulator apps, like the GNOME console app. It uses a better compression algorithm, and a lot of code has been optimized as well, so it should perform better. Tracker, the indexer tool that powers GNOME Search, has also received improvements to its sandbox, and in terms of apps, there's Overscride, a new app to handle Bluetooth devices and let you send and receive files, authenticate, support multiple Bluetooth adapters, and more. It's a smaller week than usual on the GNOME side, not that many app updates, but also it's good to see them working on the actual backend of the desktop. It's not just apps, it's also what's used to make GNOME run. 
And now it's time for our weekly update on drivers and performance improvements. First, we have a nice change to the Direct Rendering Manager Drivers, or DRM, but the good kind of DRM, not the stuff that locks everything down. These drivers will get a few improvements in the Linux kernel 6.7, but what's more interesting is that they're getting re-licensed with a dual license, the GPL v2 and the MIT license. The goal is to let these drivers be implemented in other non-GPL systems, like various BSDs, for example. However, to prevent abuse from certain manufacturers, hello NVIDIA, the kernel symbols used by these drivers will be kept GPL only, so non-GPL drivers cannot take advantage of them, something NVIDIA has tried to do repeatedly in the past. We also have some progress on the open source NVIDIA Vulkan driver, NVK. The Linux kernel 6.6 .6 will add the user space API that NVK needs, and the initial NVK code has been merged for Mesa 23.3 that should release before the end of the year. On top of that, developers are trying to land as many Vulkan extensions and improvements they can to make sure that the first release is solid. Of course, as the developer puts it, if you plan to buy an NVIDIA GPU because there's that driver coming, then you probably shouldn't, as it won't be very usable before another year or two. They're also working on a Rust-based shader compiler that will be crucial to ensure good performance in the future. So, things are looking good, with now the ability to reclog the NVIDIA GPUs, thanks to the Nouveau drivers update, plus the NVK drivers landing and the Linux kernel getting all the APIs needed, there's a very real future in which there's a complete open source NVIDIA stack that sure will not catch up with the proprietary drivers in terms of performance for a while, but will at least give you a usable experience on your devices. And for AMD, we also have some progress on ray tracing. Apparently it reached a point where gamers can expect it to just work on new titles. Some issues remain, especially for The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk, but the general expectation is that ray tracing should now just work. Of course, performance isn't stellar yet, as it still lags a bit behind the official AMD Vulkan driver's performance, so this will be the main focus for this work now. Still, ray tracing on open source AMD drivers is basically there, which is pretty nice for people who sold one of their kidneys to buy one of those new pricey GPUs. And let's finish this episode with the gaming news. First, we have NVIDIA wanting to help with Proton. An NVIDIA engineer has sent pull requests to the various components of Proton, including DXVK and VKD3D, and the goal is to add support for reflex and low latency in Proton. This specific piece of software is here to let you enable a low latency mode that will give you a much more reactive gaming experience at least when you pair it with a G-Sync compatible display and a compatible mouse and you're playing at high refresh rates. Still, it's nice to see Nvidia working with Valve to bring a better gaming experience to the people who can afford such a setup. At the X.org developer conference, XDC 2023, there's been two talks about how well HDR and color management support is progressing. The first one was from Melissa Wen from Igalia, and the second from Joshua Ashton from Valve. They specifically talked about the work they've already done to improve color management and to lend the first bits of HDR support on the Steam Deck, which is going to be available for SteamOS 3.5. There's apparently a lot more work needed to bring HDR support to the general Linux desktop. As the protocols in Wayland aren't fully defined yet, there's still no proper color management API for Linux, and various Wayland compositors will need to implement support for all of that once it's all properly laid out. At least there's a plan, and there's a first implementation for the Steam Deck. On our Linux desktops, the general use case of HDR is still a few years away, but yeah, it's being worked on, it's good. And we also have a new release of Lutris, which comes with a Steam account switcher to let you handle multiple Steam accounts from the same interface. You also get tags that you can use to sort your games. There's support for downloading Wine GE updates when Lutris starts. There's experimental support for Flatpak-based runners, so Lutris should get even more compatible with game sources. And it also now supports a newer version of Gamescope, the SteamOS compositor. 
There's also EA integration through the EA app and you can import your origin saves to the new EA prefix that Lutris will create so you don't lose any progress in the migration. Solid update here, but also apparently Lutris is sort of in trouble financially as donations have slowly dried up. It's something they only shared on Patreon, so I won't say more until they talk about it more publicly. But if you use and if you rely on Lutris, please consider donating or supporting them to make sure that they can actually keep working on the application. And please consider listening to this segue to our sponsor. If your PC is due for an upgrade and you plan to run Linux on it, stop looking at devices that ship with Windows pre-installed. Buy something that actually supports Linux's development from our sponsor, Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box and they pick all the hardware specifically because it runs well with Linux. And if there are some quirks or some issues to fix, they submit patches upstream to make sure that everyone can benefit from their work. They also have a big range of devices that should cover every need and every price point from the smallest laptops, the most affordable ultrabooks, to the highest powered gaming laptops or towers, they have it all. All my devices that I use daily, personally, are from Tuxedo, my SteamOS console and my main laptop, which is my editing device as well. So if you need a new computer and you want to make sure that Linux runs well on it and you want to support Linux's development, you want something that is openable, repairable and upgradable, click the link in the description below and get yourself a device from Tuxedo. They are really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that dislike button and the comment section as well. And if you want to support the channel, I left plenty of links in the description of the video to do just that. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.